uh, good evening and good morning for me, David. Uh, today uh, on our SIP vlog, we're going to discuss uh, your paper together with your co-authors, creating and sustaining stakeholder emotional resonance with organizational identity and social mission-driven organizations. So um, it's really interesting paper, and I think it touches upon very interesting topic, not only interesting, but also important. But could you maybe um, tell us a little bit more what actually inspired you to, to look into this issue? I think social mission-driven organizations are haven't traditionally been studied extensively in, in our field. It, the interest in them is growing, definitely. And I think that some of the dynamics of these organizations are slightly different compared to more traditional for-profit uh, organizations. So um, I think, and yet a lot of these organizations struggle to um, to build and maintain organizational identity to be continue to be um, pertinent to uh, their stakeholders. And then ultimately what they're doing, uh, as you say, I think is very important in society. So I think that we need to pay more attention to them and, and what's going on. Yeah. This particular yeah. paper came about because one of my co-authors um, joined the board of this particular organization and was able to begin a small-scale um, observational research project with them uh, and uh, came to see that they were facing some, some very significant challenges uh, related to who they were. Um, they were losing donors at various times. They were um, struggling to, to make sense of how they can continue to be relevant um, in a changing uh, world of uh, world of uh, charities, in fact, that they were operating in. So um, they were very interested in in being studied, and uh, I think it's you know the we have twenty years of of data from them, so we were able to gain access and follow their progress over quite a bit of time, which enabled us to really come up with a um, a very compelling, I think, longitudinal model for for how they how they manage to um, maintain their resonance over time. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, you mentioned that uh, the dynamics of these organizations are a little bit different. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit? What is the difference between those type of organizations compared to this commer commercial profit-driven organizations? Yeah, I think a lot of the staff, a lot of the, a lot of the key stakeholders are involved for um, non-monetary reasons. So staff, uh, supporters, um, uh, it's a voluntary, there's a large voluntary component to this organization. So people decide to, to volunteer their time to help run the organization, to, um, to join the board, to do things like this. So um, the motivation for them to participate needs to be stronger. In a sense, it needs to be stronger than purely financial. So the organization, if it's going to continue to attract this kind of interest and, and assistance from, from people, they need to really... Uh, have a compelling story of who they are and be able to communicate that and, and ensure that it stays re relevant over time. Um, because the one of the interesting things we observed is over the 20 years, um, sort of key aspects of their identity and key arguments, if you will, for um, what this organization, why it's important, what it's doing changed uh, because society changed and the, the field in which they were operating changed. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, I think what is really unique and interesting about this paper is that you re, uh, you're looking at the emotions and emotions are quite intangible and hard to observe or measure. So could you perhaps tell a little bit more uh, about your approach to the analysis? So how have you decided on what is going to be the proxy for emotion? Uh, yeah, well, it um, it came out a lot in our interviews and in our observation because we have a lot of observation data and we have a lot of interviews. So um, in terms of creating this emotional resonance, what we, we call emotional resonance with the, the organization's identity, we observed that that happened in various moments. And people, uh, when they were recounting their first encounter with the organization or, or some of the reasons, some of the moments where they decided they really needed to, to get involved, um, they became very emotional and they expressed a lot of emotional language when, when talking about that. They, um, uh, it, was, it was clear that they felt all kinds of emotions, both yeah. positive, positive and negative uh, at, at various times. Uh, and we came to see this was a really um, 
important important element to this particular organization. It wasn't, you know, cognitivist mo models of organizational identity really came up short here because um, people didn't use solely, if you will, their heads to decide to give their time and 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 money even to this organization. There was something else going on and it was linked to to their emotional connection with it. So if they didn't feel an emotional connection to the organization, those people, I mean, there were a lot of those people that kind of came and went over the years. Um, they, uh, and this was actually a concern, and this is one of the reasons why I think our, our findings are interesting, because they really directly deal with these the emotional side of, of resonance. We think of resonance as having both a cognitive and a, an emotional side. This is tends to be how how it's regarded. So the the um, something fitting in a frame, something making sense. This is the sort of resonance idea, and this can happen in a cognitive sense, but can also happen in an emotional sense. And so we became really interested in in what caused people to really resonate emotionally with this organization or not over time. Uh, I'm just really curious, given the position of one of your co-authors uh, being yeah. there and probably almost feeling the emotion there in the in the, the conversation, was it also part of your analysis? I mean, indicate in this moment when, I don't know, the, the conversation in the room become more emotional, uh, because, of course, uh, quite often in analysis, we uh, rely on a discursive uh, yeah. pieces. So how did you use then this observation to uh, identify the moments of emotion? Yeah, we had to go back. We we went back through um, through notes, through meeting minutes, through um, uh, and in interviews, people we spoke to. And, you know, I, most of our most of the key moments happen. I would a lot of them happen in, in meetings of some of some kind uh, and uh, people would recount, you know, oh, I remember when this happened and it was very, you know, it was very upsetting or this person got very upset. This person um, stood up, this person um, did something that indicated uh, the person felt emotional um, or they their voice became very quiet and they, you know, they seemed to be, you know, moved uh, in a certain way. People told us that they felt very moved by, um, you know, in the paper, we talk about a few incidents where we had a, a, a billionaire actually come and visit one of the sites of uh, that was assisted by the by the charitable organization we studied and saw a picture of himself on the wall um, as as somebody who was sort of taking money from society and as a as a bad person. And, you know, he sort of talked about how that made him feel in, in that context and how that really struck something with him he'd just never seen anything like that before and he never thought of uh, of him his role in society as being as being like that so people very openly shared a lot of these stories that um you know weren't just weren't just a sort of a cognitive exercise they really reflected some kind of emotional thing and so we tried to code for that it's very difficult i mean we we did um code we we, we would go through the transcripts afterwards and and identify these passages and, and try and assign uh, emotional coding to them so that um, when we went back over it we looked for for patterns in that and to see where where the emotions tended to rise and when they tended not to and um, that helped us in our analysis wow yeah that seems like uh, first of all you have a huge amount of data so you need to go yes. through all these different types of data and also over the 20 years <laughs> which is a lot of yeah work. Well, we did bracket it somewhat because we had periods in which we had better data so over the 20 years. Um, and and we did real we came to see that there were at least three cycles at which the organization went through a round of, well, they called it strategizing, but it was also um, revisiting their organizational identity and thinking about, well, what are, why are we here? What are we what are we trying to do? And what are we about as an organization? And yeah. and they they created committees. They they involved other stakeholders. They went through this enormous process three times, and so we ended up focusing more on those incidents over the twenty yeah. years. And then, of course, people would refer back to those in the intervening periods, but. That otherwise twenty years is, as you say, it's uh, there's uh, we would drown. Too much to we, take we're in. already drowning in data, but even but we somewhat we bracketed it to some extent. Okay, well, this is a very valuable advice, I think, for anyone who's working with mm. such a large amount of data to 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 break it into some kind of pieces. Yeah. Um, but during the analysis, you probably got 
more interesting insights than what could fit into the paper. So could you maybe share some other interesting themes coming across during your analysis? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it's interesting because this paper started out as a, our core concept, if you will, was identity anxiety, what we called and identity anxiety, which is the, um, when people became concerned, I mean, this organization's, when I say its identity was threatened, which, which, which it was, um, it's, it's threatened by, um, uh, see it by a lot of the CSR movement, see a strategic um, strategic donations, these types of things. So organizations thinking, well, why should I give my my money to a clearinghouse, which is what Solidum was, and let them decide where the most needy causes were. I want to, to give directly to an organization connected to my sustainable competitive advantage. And maybe that will, you know, Michael Porter has had a lot to say about that. And that's really um, a, val a better way to, to donate. And this is this you know, this theory became very popular and this question and this call into question Solidum's raison d'etre, its, its identity. And so um, a number of times they went through these, you know, very challenging discussions uh, in the organization and they have became very anxious about, well, if we lose, if we lose what we're doing, if we lose our identity, we've lost everything, we're nothing, we're gone. And the, the theory... Psychology talks about anxiety as a fear of um, it's a fear of loss, a fear of becoming an, an extreme. It's it's a fear of becoming you know almost nothing, um, and so we tried to use this in, in the paper, and I I still think it describes to some extent what we saw. But we actually had one reviewer uh, who um, I suspect came from a very uh, pure psychological um, uh, background, and and really really challenged us on our use of the word anxiety. Uh -huh. um, that it was um, that you know how do we how do we know it was anxiety? How do we you know what do we because anxiety there's a whole subfield in psychology <laughs> on anxiety which we didn't really know about. So again, I guess it's one of these things where you think this term sounds fantastic and you kind of, it does seem to explain things, but when, you, when you're up against an expert AMJ reviewer who sort of says, no, you can't use that term in that way. Um, we, we went through, I think our first round, we, we tried to do a better job of explaining what we meant by anxiety. And then in, this, in the second round, we, we ended up replacing it with emotional resonance because uh, it actually, it captures the emotional side and I act and I we, we kind of thought our model and we realized that it's a last a lock a last of a lack of resonance that was creating the the anxiety and so we kind of shifted a little bit our focus to more um proactive looking less at what was going on in the in the minds of the individual people in solidum and in in the group because that's another issue with anxiety it's an individual and potentially collective phenomenon yeah. so how do we tease that out and so this was becoming very difficult so um we we moved more to the outward facing or at least to external stakeholders facing concept which is emotional resonance yeah. and that um resonated better with the reviewers uh, it's it tells a story that maybe is easier to work with um as a as an organization like this, we, we provide three kind of practices that organizations like this can can engage in to um, improve the emotional resonance of their organ of your organizational identity yeah. in these types of organizations. Yeah. So that's that's how we wound up there. But the anxiety, um, yeah, I guess at some point you have to, you know, maybe in another journal, another life, it would have worked, but uh, with this one, it didn't, and. Uh, I try not to think of all the hours I spent reading about anxiety. Uh, I can imagine. In my spare time, because it, we, we basically stripped it entirely out of the paper. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's again shows how, how difficult and timely the process of creating um, such a high quality piece uh, mm. in reality and how many minds it takes to kind of get the concepts to the, to the right position, to the right level. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was also wondering, uh, emotions, I think, getting now more popular in different fields of organization study studies. Mm -hmm. And could you maybe uh, share your advice on for those who want to study emotions in organizations, on individual, on group level, on organization level, what should we pay attention to when we approach this concept? Hmm. I think um, I think it's important to get because you're going to get reviewers that will say, "How do you know that that's 
emotion X or it's emotion Y and what is the valence? Is it a positive or negative? You know, somebody can appear very excited and it could be because they're, 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 they're happy, or it could be because they're actually quite upset. Um, how do you, how do you distinguish the valence? How do you distinguish the emotion? Um, in, in these cases, I think it, it helps to have multiple sources of data. So, I mean, we had observation data and interview data. Um, it helps you triangulate a little bit. Um, it can also help to, to have, um, a sort of a, a structure to how you're what emotions you're looking at I mean there are scales out there you can use to to code the data we actually didn't use we didn't we weren't required to use a scale in this um uh paper and in another um article I've written in organization studies we use the PANAS um P-A-N-A-S uh, scale which um satisfied reviewers in that we were able to uh we, they, the PANAS scale consists of a list of distinct emotions that uh you know if because there are lots of shades of gray of course between emotions and it's always difficult to say exactly what you can also be experiencing multiple emotions uh at any given time so um i think it was helpful to have both the observation and then also to have the the pro yeah. proponent um reflect on it and talk about it afterwards so this is where having interviews and observation um was useful um other alternatives can be um video data that can provide another um, another backup for um, demonstrating what that what you've seen, you know, that backing up your observational data better better in some ways than than notes. Uh, I've used that in other in other work. So it is, I guess, the quality of the data is is really important. In this paper, we were lucky; we just had so much data, and it so many people um, would reflect have similar recollections and similar experiences of certain key moments um that you know the, the emotional side of it and then we were able in many cases even to find in the minutes at the meeting um and minutes are, are challenging because they tend to be written you know fairly a lot of the emotional content is stripped out but even reading between the lines you could still see the you know a heated you know this had a this was discussed this had a an impact or even when you look at what somebody is saying um it's uh it can be quite quite powerful so just so, to kind of summarize uh it's probably uh the key to have multiple sources of, of data to prove yeah. that what you see is exactly what you see <laughs> think you That's, yeah i think that would be my recommendation <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes it's um it's it's challenging because i think emotions are so important uh to to you know what we see in organizations today and um we've often just kind of thought oh it's too hard and we haven't really addressed it but especially if you're working with concepts like identity i think it's uh um particularly in this kind of an organization where it is it is clearly so important to to what people are doing if we try to explain what we saw without without using emotions as a as a as a, as a sort of a, a concept that we were we were interested in it would have we would have it would have been an improper impoverished um analysis i believe yeah okay well thank you so much for shedding the light on uh your paper which is uh upcoming in the um fresh issue of imj so i recommend everyone uh to take a look and to read it uh thank you so much david Thank you very much, Anna. And I really would love to thank, I, I, I didn't write the paper myself. I, I just would like to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Sawi Kawame, Taya Pafsi, and Anne Langley, who um, we made a great team. And I think uh, in the paper, we talk a little bit about our involvement, but I think uh, having a, having good co-authors is also really important. <laughs> Getting one of these things over the line if I'm talking about final recommendations. Yeah, that's a good one. Thank you, David. <laughs> Thanks a lot.